Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? I moved, moved the mic so it wasn't quite in my face. <laughs> Cynthia has asked me several times through the years to do this, and it always seemed like something came up and I canceled on her. <laughs> so when she asked me again, I was hesitant to say yes, because I'm thinking, what's going to happen now? <laughs> so, but I finally made it. Um, the first time, I think it was, that Ted exposed the kids to chicken pox. Yes, he had them first. <laughs> he got them at another Bible conference. Well, I guess he wouldn't have gotten them at the Bible conference. He came down with them at another Bible conference. and then So I thought, I better stay home with my kids. I don't think you guys would appreciate it too much if I <laughs> brought kids with chicken pox. So uh, um, then I think the last time was we were moving, so I stayed home to pack. So, you know. So um, most of you know me through my husband, Ted, and my kids. And I said, Amy plays the piano and teaches the little ones. She's done that the last few years. And uh, um, our kids have grown up. Thankful, we're thankful to uh, Shorewood for providing our way to come, because I don't know how many years we would have been able to afford to come and bring the family. But since Ted was speaking and we tried to help with the kids any way we could, that uh, they were paid our way, so we're thankful for that. That was your ministry for that. So, um, so we've been around quite a while. Uh, I guess we're one of the instigators of all this uh, through the years. So <laughs> I was gonna, uh, got started. So it's been quite quite the journey. Ted and I grew up in the Lake Geneva, Wisconsin area, so not too far from here. Uh, we met in high school through a mutual friend that went to his uh, church's youth group. And uh, so we were in the same grade, and we got married in 1976, a year after high school graduation. I guess we were the typical teen, Christian teen. We knew of our salvation, but weren't living the life that we should have been. Uh, Ted is a third generation grace believer. His grandparents learned about the grace message through the radio broadcast of J.C. O'Hare. So uh, even up in Wisconsin, we got the, they got the broadcast up there and got the literature and um, believe that. They, uh, his grandparents and parents and uh, aunts and uncles, cousins and stuff started a, their church there in Genoa City. I was a liberal Baptist. We used the Revised Standard Version and I typically just went to Sunday school until I was older and uh, started attending the church service also. But I remember in uh, Sunday school one time that our pastor was teaching us, this was before um, Ted and I were dating, so our high school class, and he was um, talking about being unequally yoked and saying, well, you know, someone's good, you know, so like it was okay to date someone who wasn't a Christian. And I was thinking in my mind, well, that's, not what the verse says. Um, so that was uh, one ins instance that uh, happened, I, I recall distinctly growing up. But I was saved, I was probably 10, 12 years old. We had a couple women that would come. They worked out of the Rural Bible Crusade. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. And they came every summer and taught our uh, vacation Bible school. So I was saved through them uh, and their ministry and they used the King James Bible and encouraged scripture memorization. So in that respect, that held, it held a special place for me. So I struggled years later about my salvation. I wondered if I'd had it backwards in some way because uh, I was saved because I knew hell was real and I didn't want to go there. And so, uh, and I knew the only way not to was to trust Christ's death on the cross. And as my payment. So then years later, I wondered if it was the right motive, if it, uh, you know, it was a nice benefit not to go there. But, uh, you know, did I have it backwards and, you know, did I say the right thing? Did I, you know, have the right reason for um, trusting Christ? So Ted was reassuring to me that it's not what you say, but it's what you believe and um, what you put your faith and trust in. And hell is a good motivator for <laughs> not doing that. So, um, and a couple things happened that started me leaning toward right division. Of course, hanging out with the kids from his youth group in high school 
and as I said before, the being unequally yoked, I remember that being taught. And the other was I was confused about the rapture and second coming. And so the kids, you know, Ted's group, we hung out um, lunchtime, we hung out before school started and uh, it gathered together. And um, so they were able to explain and I could see uh, how you can just plug in the events and see where they fit into God's plan. So um, it started, it made so much sense to me, you know, and it was, seemed like it was so simple to be able to do that. So our first several years of marriage, we were just plugging along, working. We worked the night shift at the factory. Yep, we worked at the same plant and uh, worked there several years. And then in January of 79, Pastor Sam brought up this southern dude from Alabama to our church in Genoa City. And you thought Ted preached fast on Sunday. <laughs> I know he was really zipping along. Pastor Jordan. <laughs> He has slow. I said he's gotten citified now. <laughs> he's just, he preached so fast. And then with his southern drawl, it's like, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> and uh, so, and I just love a southern accent. I said, they can insult you and it still sounds nice. <laughs> so, um, so Pastor Jordan just blew us away when he preached there that weekend. And I remember the snow was piled high. Well, you guys have it now. We moved up to the, it was piled up really high. And uh, Ted's uncle afterwards came up to us and said, well, if you like preaching like that, then you need to come to the summer Bible conference. So away we went that summer and on our motorcycle and went to our first summer Bible conference and, and Ted hasn't missed a one since. So now instead of plodding along, we were growing and becoming more interested in spiritual things. We started becoming involved in his church, our church, I shouldn't say his church. And you know what? The same people we grumbled about as teenagers were still there standing for the truth and doing the work of the ministry. And now we were standing alongside of them and learning and working with them. Amy was born in the fall of 81 and we felt a burden to do more to get the grace message out to others. And even though Ted was raised in a grace church, he felt he needed training to become a pastor. But where and how do we do that? We knew of only two places, which would have meant he had to quit work and move, and we just didn't know how we would do that or could do that. So we approached Pastor Jordan, or Ricky as we knew him back then, and uh, to get his perspective. And the rest is history. We started the class. Uh, Lisa was born in the spring of 83, and Ted started class that fall. That's what we called it. And uh, we had a teenage girl that came and lived with us for several years. Her name was Dorothy while she finished high school. And um, then about halfway through the class, Ted started pastoring his home church. So he was pretty busy with working full-time, pastoring, and taking Grace School of the Bible. And then beginning in 1990, we moved to Ohio. Our twins, Kurt and Kyle, were only eight months old, and we just celebrated 25 years there at Green Bible, at Green Bible Church in Louisville now. We were in Minerva for many years. We had Sadie the beginning of 92, our only Buckeye baby. So now we said we had a full house. We had three of a kind and a pair. <laughs> so the kids will ask me to tell them stories of when they were young, and I just say it's all a blur. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I said, I feel like Winnie the Pooh, a uh, bear of little brain and stuffed with fluff. <laughs> so don't ask me where a verse is found. Um, I'm so thankful for a strong concordance and smarter than me devices. <laughs> so please uh, don't be offended if I can't remember your name. Um, terrible. Um, I always have been. I can't blame it on age. <laughs> I never was able to memorize, and, and it always boggled my mind, the kids we have and the scripture they're able to memorize year after year. So um, I stick with teaching the kids and I know when they start asking questions I can't answer, it's time for them to go on. <laughs> so um, this past year has been a reflective one for me. I think it started when at Ted's birthday and he is the age 
that his father was. He's the age now that his father was when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And also um, dealing with my mom, whose mind is pretty much gone. So I got to thinking about um, if I followed after her, I probably have 10 good years left. And there's things I wanted to do. I was like, I better get cracking at them <laughs> and get them done. So I started crossing off things that I thought would never happen. I started off crossing off things that weren't important anymore that they, as they were when we were younger. And I wrote a few things down that I wanted to do. So I pray I, that I won't be too grumpy. I've al already apologized to Ted if I, because I tend to be the negative one. He's the positive. So I figure we make a pretty good battery and we keep humming along. <laughs> so I find myself like Naomi a lot of times, maybe not so much bitter, but sad and brokenhearted and weary at times when the kids disappoint you or the congregation disappoints you. But even Naomi had some bright sunshine in her life and something to look forward to. And we are looking forward to a fifth generation, Grace Believer, as Kyle and Hannah start their family. My favorite hymn and favorite verse are a lot alike. The second verse of Living for Jesus says, Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bury on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call, follow his leading, and give him my all. And my favorite verse is Romans 12:1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2 tells us how to do that. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you, may be that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ted grew up under Pastor Baker, Hoy Baker, and he always said, it's not how you start, but how you finish. And the ladies I was saved through said, to retire is to get four new ones and keep going. So no matter what stage of life you find yourself at, we just never know when our work on earth will, will be done. So I pray that folks will be able to say of us, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Thank you. Before I start, um, some of you may know Susie Grest. That name may be familiar to you. Um, Susie is uh, a woman who used to come to this conference. She lives in Switzerland, and she's not able to come anymore because of health issues. But she asked if I would please greet all of you from her. So that's what I am doing. <laughs> okay, let's just open in a word of prayer, and then we will begin. Father, we thank you that we can be together this afternoon as a group of women. We thank you that we have you in common. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us, went to the cross to die for us and pay for all of our sin with his blood. We thank you for that, and we pray that everything that we do and say right now, this afternoon, might honor and glorify him. For we pray this in his precious name. Amen. I'd like you to, uh, you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15. And we're going to look at the 58th verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I apologize if I move fast. I do. So you're going to have to hang in there with me, okay? So we get everything in here. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, as I've thought about this verse over the years, 
I've always believed that abounding in the work of the Lord had to do with ministry, such as teaching a Sunday school class, doing nursery duty at the conference, being a pastor, um, being a Sunday school teacher, um, visiting shut-ins, making meals for people who were disabled or, or just couldn't take care of that anymore. And while it is that, there is a component of the work of the Lord that needs to come before all of that. And this component is vital. I think the first thing that we need to do is ask the question, what is the work of the Lord? And as far as I can see, the answer to that is over in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Abounding in the work of the Lord, then, is very simply, first of all, knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin. And the instant you do that, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. And he begins to do his work in you. Now, what does that work, what does that work, how, do, how, how is that work seen? Well, Paul talks about that in the next few verses. Let's read them together, starting with verse 7. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. As the work of the Lord abounds in us, and that simply means we are taking in the doctrine. We are studying God's word, rightly divided. And the more we take in that word, the more the Spirit can use that word in our life. And the goal of that word is to love one another. Paul says that here. I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment. Now, how is that possible? How is that possible for us? Paul has said here, or Paul basically is showing that understanding the doctrine, the work of the Lord working in him, he has been filled with the deep, compassionate love that Jesus Christ has for his people. The heart of Jesus Christ for each believer is to be conformed to his image, experiencing his life. How is that possible? Simply because he has revealed to us all wisdom. How do I know that? Because I have the completed word of God. If you'll turn over to Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 19. Ephesians three nineteen, it says, And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Colossians 1.9 For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
We have the word of God, ladies. We have no excuse. We need to study that word. And when we study that word, the Holy Spirit who has been given to us works that word in us. And then that word can come out from us. Okay? Go back to Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Jesus Christ. You can only do that by understanding God's word. And you can only understand God's word by rightly dividing that word. God's word reveals his will to us. And his will for us today is really very simple. It's found in 1 Timothy 2, 4. And it simply says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul talks here about how our love is to abound. Did you know that according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, to love someone does not come naturally to us. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. We don't naturally love others first. We love ourselves. We are selfish. If you don't think you are, get into a group picture, a photograph. And when that photograph is developed, who do you look for first? (laughs) Yourself. If you want to watch... um, people who, who really don't know much about loving others, start working with little children. It's me. I remember as a kid, we would play games, and somebody would always yell, I'm first. And I always said, I'm first first. <laughs> See, we don't naturally love. Why? Because we have a sin nature. And it's all about us. We must be taught love of God, and that only comes as we are laboring in God's word. If we don't, the work of the Lord is not going to abound in us. The work of the Lord abounding in us, firstly, is the transformation of the inner man. And that only comes by being steadfast, unmovable, and laboring in our intake of Bible doctrine. You know, our verse is 2 Timothy 2.15, and that verse literally says that, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Studying God's word is work. I think it's very interesting that the word of God does not go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. God puts all these little nuggets all over the scripture. And you'll be reading a passage and all of a sudden, here's something way over here in Isaiah that should you thought, why wasn't that back in Genesis? You know, no, I, I think God does that. Like somebody was saying this morning, God has an enormous sense of humor. And, and, and I, think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. God wants us to study his word, not just to read it. Anybody can read it. But taking time and studying it, working at that word, getting that word into us. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 says, much study is a weariness of the flesh. Most of us would rather opt out. You know, I'll, I'll put that off until tomorrow. I just don't have time today. But the rewards of the study of the word of God are overwhelming. 
Because first of all, it renews our mind so that we can have victory over our flesh. My old sin nature wants to deceive me. But as was brought out this morning um, in Romans chapter 6, I am dead to sin and I am alive unto Christ. When I believe that, then I have the ability to live the truth and not a lie. And I can trust Christ with all my needs and just relax. Abounding in the work of the Lord instructs me that grace is all about liberty. Please turn over to Galatians chapter number 5, verses 1 and 13. Galatians 5, verses 1 and 13. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. See, wasn't that what Paul said? Let that work of the Lord abound in you so that the love of the Lord is going to abound in you. And grace gives me that liberty to love others. You know, there's a verse in Romans 13, 8 that says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. He that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. It's just that simple. The liberty I have in grace enables me to love and to serve others. And it allows me to evaluate my motives and my priorities. God's word does, God's word teaches me in a way that is not judgmental because God's word begs me, it beseeches me. It doesn't hit me over the head with a hammer as I'm studying it. God speaks to me as a loving Heavenly Father. His rebuke, his instruction, his reproof are done in a loving way. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians 16, 15. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Grace gives me the liberty and the freedom to do what this verse says. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. We can be addicted to the ministry of the saints as we labor in the word and in ministering to others, and the work of the Lord is abounding in us. One of the other things that abounding in the work of the Lord does, and go back to uh, Philippians chapter 1 again, verse number 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. It fills me with the fruits of righteousness as I am taking in that word and the Holy Spirit is using that word in me, teaching me, teaching me so that I can live out the life that Christ wants me to live and love others. It also does what Colossians 3.16 says, and this verse was brought up this morning, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You can't do ministry work and do it honestly until the work of the Lord abounds in you because any other work is just going to be empty. It's going to be done in, 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 for your own selfishness. 
as the work of the Lord is abounding in us, we are taking in that doctrine, we are edified, and we are built up. So that when the groanings of life come, we can go through those things. And we can go through them in a victorious way. You know, a lot of times when things happen, I I try to find in Scripture somebody whose life is kind of exemplary of, of what's happening in my own life. And as I was thinking about this passage of abounding in the work of the Lord, I was studying this back around December. I teach fourth and fifth graders at Shorewood, and uh, we do the timeline, and we had come to the birth of Christ. And I, was, I began to study about Mary, and it was incredible to me what I saw in Mary's life that showed that she was abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, granted, she did not have the completed scriptures. She knew nothing about right division. She didn't know the message of grace. But I think that there are unbelievable examples of the work of the Lord abounding in Mary's life. And I would like to look at her this afternoon. So if you will please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 1. We will see what we can learn here from this. In the first chapter of Luke, we are introduced to a man by the name of Zacharias. Zacharias was a priest. He was in the temple at Jerusalem, and he was involved in his course. Up until this time, for 400 years before this, God had been silent. Israel had been in total disobedience to God, and God had warned them and warned them and warned them, and finally, he was just quiet. There was no word from the prophets, no word from anybody. And here's Zacharias in the temple, and the 400 years is over. And the angel Gabriel speaks to Zacharias, and he says in verse, well, let's look at 11, 111, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Now, ladies... Zacharias worked in the temple. He had access to the scrolls, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. But we can understand from this passage that Zacharias probably had not wasted his time reading these things. The angel Gabriel says to him, Zacharias, for thy prayer, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, Zacharias shouldn't have been shocked at being given this information if he had read the third chapter of the book of Malachi, but obviously he had not. He knew nothing about this. And Zacharias says to Gabriel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. The angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these things. And behold, thou shalt not, or thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Zacharias was struck dumb for the next nine months and could not say a word, because why? He did not believe the word of God. Skip down to verse number 26. 
And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Okay, Mary's getting the same answer from Gabriel that Zacharias had gotten. Don't be afraid. Mary is troubled. Why is Mary troubled? Well, he says to her, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, Mary was engaged. She was betrothed to Joseph. But she had never had sexual relations with him. How is she going to have this child? And I want you to think about Mary. If I took you down with me to the Art Institute of Chicago today, and I took you into the wing of paintings, the oldest paintings in that museum there, which the earliest art that they have back around the 13th and the 14th century, when a lot of the art was religious, you would see paintings of Mary. She's like this, and there's a halo over her head. Ladies, that was not what Mary looked like. Mary was a human flesh and blood just like you and me. And I want you to think to yourself, what would it have been like if you had been told that you were going, in a sense, to bear an illegitimate child? Now, I want you to think about Mary. She lived in this tiny little town called Nazareth. Just a little podunk nothing place. Little tiny towns, everybody knows everybody's business. There was no way that Mary was going to be able to hide this. If she had lived in Jerusalem, she could have gotten lost in the crowd. But in Nazareth, no, no. Everybody was going to know. The shame, the embarrassment that it was going to bring to her family, to herself, to Joseph. And you know, Joseph was troubled over this. He was going to put her away privately. And it wasn't until the angel said to Joseph in a dream, you know, you take Mary, you marry her, just don't have relations with her until after this baby is born. But this was huge. This was trauma. Plus, Mary is living under the law. And under the law program, if a woman was found pregnant outside of marriage, she would be stoned. The angel says to her in answer in verse 35, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. What was Mary's response to this? Look at verse number 38. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word completely different from Zacharias, who did not believe what the angel said to him. But Mary is submissive to the words of the angel Gabriel. She leaves, and she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country. I want you to look at verse number 44. 
because Elizabeth speaks when Mary comes into the house and says, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Look at this next verse. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Zacharias did not believe. Mary did. And I ask you, how could she do that? From verses 47 through 55, Mary quotes scripture. She quotes from Malachi 3, Psalm 111, Psalm 103, Exodus 15, Job 40, and Psalm 58. How could this have been? Mary did not live in Jerusalem. She was not near the temple. She didn't have access to the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. You know what I believe? I believe that somebody taught Mary the word of God. And you know why I believe that? Because it doesn't say there that Mary was suddenly filled with the Holy Ghost and began to prophesy. It does not say that. Look over at verse number 67. Because as soon as John is born... His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, see, now John, uh, Zacharias is beginning to quote scripture. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. It tells us that he is. It doesn't say that about Mary. I believe that somebody taught Mary God's word. Be it a father, a mother, a grandmother, an uncle, an aunt, I don't know. Somebody had to have because Mary didn't have access to any of that word. And when Mary was being taught those scriptures, she wasn't thinking, oh boy, I better learn these Bible verses because someday I'm going to be the mother of Messiah. She had no clue. But she had the right scripture for the right time. I challenge you, ladies. Teach your children the scriptures. And I'm not just saying read it to them. Help them memorize it. I don't know how you're going to do that. That's, that's the fun part of it. Play a game with them. Learn it with them. What a concept, huh? Memorize those scriptures and get those scriptures into your children. Even if you're a grandmother sitting here, get those scriptures into your grandchildren. If you're a Sunday school teacher, get those scriptures into your children. When we had our Sunday school program in December, our kids, our kids, it's, oh, there's always scripture that they have to memorize. And that next morning, that Sunday morning, Richard said, it's just wonderful to see these children learning the word of God because it's through the word of God that the Holy Spirit is working today. And the more scripture that is built up in a person's life, the more the Holy Spirit is going to be able to use that word in them. And, you know, I know because I teach Sunday school and I give them verses and they got to learn those verses and they got to learn them word perfect. There's no messing around in my class. And they come to me and they say, it's so hard. (laughs) Do you know that the easiest version of the Bible to memorize is the KJV? You really only have to have a third grade reading level. 
I've seen kids, and I'm dating myself because I've got grandchildren. You know, I don't even know if kids play with these toys anymore. My grandchildren are 16 years old. But I had grandchildren. They could tell you the name of every Transformer and what they did, every G.I. Joe figure and what they did, every Star Wars figure and what they did. Now, if a kid can learn that, last summer, my grandsons are up with me from Georgia, and they brought Frozen with them. And we sat and watched Frozen. They could sing every song, and they could give every line. Now, don't tell me children cannot learn the word of God. And I think the example here is Mary. And that word worked and abounded in her. And that's why she responded the way that she did. She's in her ninth month. And all of a sudden, the world has to be taxed. And everybody's got to go to the city of their heritage. And because Mary and Joseph were of the, line, the lineage of David, they had to leave Nazareth and take a 66-mile trip down to Bethlehem. And Mary is nine months pregnant. Have you ever been nine months pregnant? Would you want to get on the back of a donkey at nine months and go 66 miles? I don't think so. But Mary did. And they get down to Bethlehem. And I'm wondering, is Mary thinking, how is this going to work? I'm leaving my mom. I'm leaving the midwife. I'm leaving my grandmother. People who are going to help me deliver this baby. And she's taking this donkey ride down. And they come into Bethlehem, and of course there's no room for them, and they end up in a stable. I saw a picture of what stables looked like in those days. They were nothing more than dugout caves. And I'm sure that thing stunk. I don't know about you ladies when you had your first baby. Oh, I remember when I had my first child. We lived in a two-room apartment. We took this little bedroom and we painted the walls, and we papered them, and we put in carpeting, and we got a crib, and we got a dressing table. And, you know, it was like the ladies at the church had a shower, and it was like I couldn't wait to bring my baby home and into this beautiful little room. And here's Mary. She's got to put this baby in a feed box. And who delivered that baby? <laughs> Joseph, duh. Would your husband have done that? Maybe if he was an ob gyne doctor, huh? <laughs> I told this story. I had four kids, and um, my husband and I went through birth classes so that he could be in labor and delivery with me. But he was at my head. He never came down by my feet. But the last, the last baby that I had, uh, Jonathan, he was born January 30th. It was 25 below zero windchill that night as we were on our way to the hospital in this little tiny VW Super Beetle. And I'm in the back doing the baby rock. And I think every single baby in Chicago was being born that night because the, the labor room was just mobbed. And they were giving all of us enemas to get us going so that we could move on. And Joe is standing by me. He was going to school full-time and working full-time, so he was just dead on his feet because it's 1230 in the morning. And uh, they give me this enema, and Joe is just turning green, and he says, Barbara, I have to go sit down. I can't be here with you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, here's Mary. What's she doing? Joseph couldn't leave. You know, somebody had to help her. I want you to think about this, ladies. Think about Mary. How could she do this? Why? We've seen that the word, the work of the Lord was abounding in her. And then, who's the first visitors? Now, when your kids are born, who comes? Grandma, your sister, your girlfriend. Who did she have? A bunch of shepherds she didn't even know. And in these guys come, and I can imagine, I mean, you know, the shaggy and probably smelled. And, you know, here she's holding this precious little baby looking at these guys. Who are they, you know? What is her response? 
look at verse number 19 of chapter 2. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Eight days later, she's back on the donkey. And they're going six miles north to Jerusalem because Jesus has to be circumcised. And while they are there, in walks Simeon. Now, Simeon worked in the temple, and he had been told by the Lord's Christ that he would, by the Lord, that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And Simeon comes walking in. And what does he say? Look at verses 34 and 35 of chapter 2 of Luke. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That was not real happy congratulations, was it, on the birth of a brand new baby, to be told that this baby is going to grow to be a man, and when he becomes a man, it's going to, a sword, almost literally, it's like it's going to be plunged into your heart and turned. And that's exactly what happened. If you go over in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Now, Mary had other kids. She had sons and she had daughters. But, her, but Jesus is giving her over to John, the beloved disciple. You know what? Mary was willing. She didn't balk. She went with John. He took her into her her into his home. What I find curious about that is why didn't she go with her other kids? Now we know from scripture that Jesus' brethren did not believe him. And you know, I kind of wonder what that home must have been like. Because here's Jesus, perfect. He never did anything wrong. And then you got all these other brothers and sisters who are always getting into trouble, and Jesus is never being yelled at or spanked or anything. And you can imagine the animosity and the jealousy that must have been there on the part of those brothers and sisters. And they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe he was who he said he was. Is that the reason why Mary was sent to John. I, I don't really know. But Mary was willing to go with him. And if you go back to Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 51, <clears throat> it says there, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Once again, she knew God's word, and God's word was working in her. It was abounding in her. And what did it give her? It gave her calmness, comfort, peace, and contentment so that she could go through these things. It is so important that we lay a foundation of God's word in our life. You start building a house, you put in a basement. You just don't leave a crummy, junky basement down there where you put all your junk. 
you make it nice, make a finished basement, go to that first floor, you build that first floor, the second floor, the third floor, you put a roof on it. That's what we're to do with the word of God. We are to let that word work in us, edify us, build us up so that no matter what comes our way, we can have victory. We are in a total victory program because we have the complete word of God. I know I, you know, I look at you ladies and you're all, you look so lovely and pleasant. And yet I, I do know, I, I talk to women, there's heartache. There's problems out there. Problems in your homes, problems at work, problems with kids. None of us escape it. Not a one. That's why we need to let the work of the Lord abound in us. Build that word up in us so that we can face whatever comes our way. One last thing about Mary that I found very interesting. If you will go over, please, to the book of Acts, chapter number 1. Jesus Christ has, been, has ascended up into heaven, and verse number 12 says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Eltheus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. First of all, Mary was doing as a widow what she was supposed to do. If you look over at 1 Timothy chapter number 5, and verse number 5, it says, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Mary was doing that here in this verse. She was supplicating. She was praying. But I think that last phrase is the most telling. With his brethren. His brothers came around and believed that Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God. Ladies, don't ever Give up on your kids. Don't. There is nobody, excuse me for this, got some of that heartache in my life. There is nobody who is beyond redemption. And I think when we look at people like this and we see their faithfulness to the word of God, it's an encouragement to us to stay faithful in that word, no matter what. No matter what. What about our apostle? How did he deal with the vicissitudes and the heartaches of life? Would you please go over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And we're going to start at verse number 16. Acts 20, 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, 
serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Yea, and all those that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What did Paul do? He says in verse 24, But none of these things move me. See, the work of the Lord was abounding in him. He was steadfast. He was un movable he had that word let's read verses 28 through 31 take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood for I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul is speaking here to very mature believers. This is the church at Ephesus. These people understood the doctrine that Paul had given to them. And yet he is warning them about wolves that are going to come in and are going to lead them astray. And even within their own assembly, there are going to be men who are going to be teaching perverse things. You know, I've been coming to these conferences for a long, long time. And every year I look around and I look for people who I've seen year after year after year. And all of a sudden they're not here anymore. And so you ask. Where's so-and-so? What, what happened to, where are they? They're gone. They've fallen off the cliff. They've gone after other doctrine. Some of the stalwarts are gone. And you say, how can that happen? The work of the Lord was not abounding in them. They were not taking in that doctrine. They were getting stuck in wrong doctrine. What does it say in Philippians? Their God became, or their belly became their God, you know, when they were moving off into placing themselves under the law program again. It's going to happen. But Paul says in verse 32, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Paul warns them. Look over real quickly, keep your hand here, and go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in 
me mightily. See, it's all what's going on inside. It's in the inner man. Warning, teaching, preaching, that we may present every man perfect, mature, fully grown. Paul is leaving Ephesus. It says in verse number 36, And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. The word accompany means to connect. These believers had connected with Paul and Paul with them. This is another reward that comes from the work of the Lord abounding in us. And that is that we can be a comforter. You know, a lot of times uh, when you think of the word comforter, you think of a down-filled blanket. It's dark outside. It's raining or sleeting or snowing, and you take that comforter and you just wrap yourself in it and fall asleep. But if you look at the root word of comforter, it is fort. A fort is a place of strength. It's a place of security. The love of Christ, which is mine because of the grace that I have been given, enables me to come alongside those who are in need just as the Ephesians accompanied Paul to the ship. They ministered to him, and he ministered to them. Paul goes on that ship, and in verse number 4 of chapter 21, finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took sheep, ship, and they returned home again. Once again, there's a connection between the body members and Paul. Paul does go on to Jerusalem. And he's arrested and sent to Caesarea, where he is left bound. You know, one of the beautiful things about being a believer is the bond that we have with one another. I believe there are two reasons why we have been left on this earth. The first is that we are here as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We stand in his stead. We beseech you to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ and to preach the ministry of reconciliation. To share wherever we can that if a person simply believes that they are the sinner that Christ died for and that he paid for their sins with his blood on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day, they can have eternal life in heaven and be forgiven. That's our responsibility as ambassadors. The second responsibility that we have is to comfort one another. Jesus Christ is not here. We've been left here in his stead. All through scripture, the Lord used people to support and comfort and edify one another. Jonathan was there for David. Elisha was there for Elijah. Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man, was ministered to by angels after he was tempted by Satan, and also in the Garden of Gethsemane, angels came and ministered to him. And Paul was comforted. We will go over to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Starting with verse 7. 
all my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. We have been left here for one another. We are to minister to one another. We are to edify to one another. We are to build one another up in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to close with two verses or two passages. One is in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 verses 11 through 14. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and to be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. And lastly, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. The result of the work of the Lord abounding in us will be that we will be steadfast and unmovable and the love of the Lord will not be able to help but to spill out of us to one another. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you that you are a God who cannot lie and so we can explicitly trust everything that is in this book. We are so thankful for that. We thank you most of all for your precious son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to die for us, that we could be forgiven and be given eternal life with you in heaven forever. We pray for these women here. We know that they come from many different walks of life. They come from all over the country. Each one of them has needs. Each one of them will go home from this conference filled with just the wonderful knowledge of your word that we are getting. And we know that many times it's so wonderful and so exciting to be here. And then we go home and we're faced with life. And we just pray that the words that are spoken here might be impressed in our hearts and in our minds and that we will take these words and that we will use them, that we will let your spirit teach us so that wherever we go, 
Jesus Christ will be seen in us and glory and praise and honor will be brought to him. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. You want to take your books and turn to number three. When you can stand, and we're going to end with that. Barbara's here if you'd like to say thank you or don't beat her over the head. No. <laughs> just say praise the Lord for his word. Okay. Is that the end? No one. <laughs> My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves this, it's my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We'll say, ladies, we have 30 minutes before they're in here for a seminar, so take time to, you know, fellowship with each other and, and thank Barbara for her message and Sue for her testimony. And thank you for coming and giving up your afternoon, and I hope the dads aren't too upset we've been in here this long. <laughs> so. yeah. And didn't drown a few kids while they're out there. So.